everyone. It's great to see you back here. Our second last time, le second last uh, lecture before we finish with the uh, New Testament. And as is our custom tonight, I want to read from uh, one of the books that we're going to look at in a few moments, First Peter, in fact. And I want to read a few uh, extracts from uh, chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2. And I want to start reading with uh, verse 4. <coughs> And Peter is saying, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I would like to point out that the New Testament is deeply steeped in Old Testament thought. In fact, you can't really appreciate the New Testament fully unless you also understand the background of the Old Testament, which is why it's so important that we don't just read the New Testament. As, as important as the New Testament is for us, we need to understand that there's a huge amount of background to the New Testament that goes back to what I believe God's plan, uh, what God was planning right from the beginning. Um, I believe Jesus was God's plan from the beginning. And Jesus called Abraham, created the nation of Israel, and through many years and ups and downs, he revealed himself. We saw that in the book of Hebrews last week. <clears throat> and God sent Jesus into this world as his final revelation, the final word of God, going back to the Gospel of John. And, and you'll pick that concept up. You'll, you'll pick up on that every time, almost everywhere you read in the New Testament, that there is this huge Old Testament background it, it's, it's not a different story. It's, uh, uh, it's almost just the second half of one single story that God started writing right from the beginning. And as we'll see in a moment, it looks like Peter, although we may not necessarily know to whom he wrote specifically like we do with the letters of Paul, very easy with Paul, and relatively easy to create a bit of a background picture as we have seen again and again. As he traveled and you look at his chronology, his history in the book of Acts, and you uh, put the pieces together throughout all of his epistles, you have a fair uh, view of the Apostle Paul and what he's done and the dates and everything and where he traveled and to whom he wrote. So it's relatively easy to put a background picture together. As we saw last week with the introduction of the general epistles, that it's not that easy with the general epistles, of which First Peter and Second Peter form part of. And over here, we don't know exactly to whom Peter was necessarily writing, but the one thing that seems to be clear from verse 9, that it, it seems to be a Gentile, or at least a predominantly Gentile audience, and uh, that becomes clear when you look at uh, chapter 1, and we'll go back there uh, in a little while. But Peter says to them that there, were a t there was a time when you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And that is a uh, a significant Old Testament concept. In fact, Israel was called by God and, and God called them to be His people. And that was a, a, a term that God used right throughout the Old Testament for His people. Peter picks up on that and he says to people who primarily represent a non-Jewish background, there was a time when you were not the people of God. Now you are the people of God. He says, you are the chosen people. The, the, the concept of being chosen or being elected uh, 
Again, you pick that up in several places in the New Testament. It comes straight out of the Old Testament. God selected, God chose, elected a people to be His own. And that same concept is uh, drawn in, uh, into the New Testament. You're a royal priesthood. Royal being a kingly uh, of royal descent. And priesthood, you are your kings and priests, is really what Peter is saying uh, to the Christians. In fact, it's what he's saying to us, is what God is saying to us, is that we are, I am part of his people. I am a king in God's kingdom. I am a priest in God's kingdom. And so that concept of royal priesthood, this is a, almost a special class, if you wish, even in the Old Testament. And yet in the New Testament, anyone who belongs to Christ is someone who belongs to the royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Again, the concept of the nation of Israel, holy meaning, holy being separated or set aside or special to God. You, you belong to me. And so Peter is saying to this new bunch of Christians, you are a holy nation. You have been chosen by God. You have been set aside by God. You belong to God. It's like you are God's toothbrush. Nobody else is using his to toothbrush like nobody else would want to use yours or you didn't, wouldn't want to use any, anybody else's. You separate, you're special, you are set apart by God. And you're a people belonging to God. I think it speaks for itself. And then there's a purpose. And, and this was the purpose for Israel also in the Old Testament. And I, I believe that they have failed in that purpose. Uh, we see it in books like Jonah and several of the prophets, the prophetic books again and again where Israel failed to be the witness to the world. Right from the beginning, God said to Abraham, I'm calling you, sending you to a land. You don't even know where it is, but I will make you a blessing to everybody, and I will bless the nations through you. That was the purpose of God right from the start. And again, it's our purpose. And um, so Peter says as he comes to the middle of verse, 10, verse, verse 9, that you, so that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. What is our role? What is my role? My role is to proclaim the praises, to, um, to declare the praises of God. That means to live for the glory of God. That goes all the way back to Genesis 1. Created in the image of God so that I, so that we as human beings, as humanity can reflect the glory of God reflect the image of God in this world. And through Jesus Christ, and only through Jesus Christ, that has become possible for us to belong to God, to His kingdom, to be priests, to be kings in His kingdom for the purpose of declaring the praises of God, the praises of God, the glory of God. And to do that through our witness, what we say, the way we live, the way we work, everywhere we go. That, I think, is the beauty of the New Testament message that God has called us into this intimate relationship with Himself so that we in turn can be uh, people who live for the glory of God and therefore extend the kingdom of God uh, in this world in preparation for the second coming. We'll talk more about the second coming next time when we look at the, the book of Revelation. And then also in the last module, there's a whole lesson or lecture just on the second coming uh, itself. This has really been a blessing to me as I, as I look at the continuation, and that's what I want to call it, the continuation between Old and New Testament. It's not like there's a break and now it's all made brand new. It's a new thing. In a certain sense, yes, it's new. It's a new covenant. But in a certain sense, it's a continuation of everything that God started doing in the Old Testament. And that we see clearly here in uh, Peter. So as we get into the lecture time, let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for an opportunity to come, to learn, to extend or expand our knowledge, our knowledge of the Word, and I pray that as we go through these letters tonight, that you would stimulate our thinking, our thoughts, um, our minds, that you would refresh us, and that we would be able to bring glory and honor to you, not only in the way that we learn, but certainly in the way that we apply these truths also to our own lives. Make us faithful to you, O oh Lord. We thank you that you are always faithful and that you have been faithful through the thousands of years of uh, calling Abraham and the, the start of Christianity and into our time as well. We give you all the praise and honor and glory and we do so 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right, that's the journey that we, we've been on the New Testament so far. We have looked at um, the background to the New Testament, and then we looked at the story of Jesus, how God sent Jesus into this world. Uh, that story is told to us in the Synoptic Gospels and also in the Gospel of John, the four Gospels. We then journeyed with uh, Peter and John and the Jerusalem church and the expansion of the church over Judea, Samaria, and literally to the ends of the earth, the known earth at the time, uh, through the Roman Empire, following especially the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. And then we have looked at the teachings and the development of the church uh, as we find it on the pages of the epistles in the letters. There you have to sort of more read through, uh, between the lines because it's not history as such. It's mostly giving guidance to churches and to individuals as to how they should live. And so that's how the story of the New Testament unfolds. And we are going to continue that. We've already looked at uh, Hebrews and James, the first two of the general epistles. And tonight we're going to look at first, second Peter, first, second and third John. And we're going to look at the book of Jude. So we'll cover all of them. They're not long. Uh, most of them are shorter letters in the New Testament. I encourage you to do additional and extra reading. These books are really not that long, and so it would be relatively easy to read through them in one week, literally. You can read through all of them in one week. Um, the, the book of First John is only five chapters long. Uh, you can, if, even if you just read a chapter a day, you, you will read through John in five days' uh, time. So I want to encourage you to do that, but also to do some internet and Bible dictionary searches on any of the concept or letters or names uh, that we pick up um, in these letters. When we come to the letters of Peter, um, I've done a bit of an extract from uh, chapter 2, just uh, indicating how the Old Testament continues into the New, and this is one single message, one single gospel, uh, if you really wish, uh, and that is the gospel of God. In fact, Several times in the New Testament, it is actually called the gospel of God, the good news of God, or the salvation of God, God's salvation. Uh, we, we should never in our minds separate Christ from God, uh, because Jesus is God, He's part of the Trinity. And so the plan of God uh, unfolds right from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Uh, and that picture we will pick up next time when we look at uh, the book of uh, Revelation. I call the letters of Peter letters from a church leader, uh, to churches, or uh, we'll look at, at the details to whom he wrote. But these letters are both attributed to the Apostle Peter, form part of the general epistles, as we have, have already seen. Um, they probably some of the lesser known letters among the lesser known letters, along with the second and third John, probably. I don't know how many times you've read through second and third John, uh, and through first and second Peter. Um, 1 John is relatively known to most Christians, but not all of us go and spend a lot of time in Peter and in the other little letters. And then Jude is only a one chapter, one of those one chapter letters as well. And, and not many of us spend enough time there. So tonight will be a good time to be introduced to some of the concepts that we find and the background to these letters as well. Uh, I think oftentimes when we get into the New Testament letters, we, we get stuck into the letters of Paul, which is great and amazing. I mean, how can you ever skip Ephesians or the book of Romans or not read Colossians or Philippians and so on? But I think we do ourselves a disfavor if that's the only thing that we read. We need to continue to read the rest of the epistles as well. Um, when it comes to the author, there are many who doubt the authenticity of these letters, either First Peter, Second Peter, or both of those. They both actually start by referring, uh, in typical letter-writing fashion, to the author. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's First Peter. Second Peter starts slightly differently. It says, Simon Peter. And in the literal Greek, it actually says, Simeon. Simeon Peter, or Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, we will give attention to the authorship in, in just a moment. Uh, but just to highlight the fact that if you are going to read some other, especially more scholarly works, then you will find many scholars who have lots of arguments about the authorship of uh, either First Peter, Second Peter, or both. Maybe some will accept 
first Peter, but not second Peter, or vice versa. Uh, and some people would, would simply say it, ca it cannot be Peter himself who wrote these letters, uh, and so on. I personally believe that there is enough evidence uh, in the scriptures, in these letters, to believe that Peter wrote these letters, and that is confirmed by the early church tradition. And so I honestly believe 2,000 years later, uh, we are not in a position to really argue with either the author who put it together or with the early church tradition who attributed these two letters to uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter. So when it comes to the man Peter, I think we, we know him well from the Gospels. Most of us have probably read many of the things about Peter. Uh, it is Peter in, uh, in the Greek who is ho Petros. Uh, and that literally means a rock or the rock. And um, in the Greek, you always use the definite article with the name uh, Jesus, for example, as ho Jesus, literally the Jesus, but you obviously just read it as the name Jesus or Peter or whatever. And Peter also had a, a Hebrew or an Aramaic name, Cephas, and uh, that meant the exact same thing, and that means uh, rock. Uh, and so that's the name that Jesus gave him. In John chapter 1, verse, 20, verse 42, Peter, as we know by now, probably was a fisherman by trade. Um, he owned a house and he was married. Um, we know he was married because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Um, I had one person say, actually a guide in Israel say once, uh, that is why Peter denied Jesus, uh, because he healed his mother-in-law. Now, of course, that uh, is simply a joke, and hopefully it, it remains a joke. Um, but... Peter um, oftentimes is referred to as a simple man. And, and that is probably true, um, because he would have been trained in the local synagogue. He would have learned something about the law, the, the Pentateuch, as we uh, refer to that. Uh, he certainly was literate in the sense that he would, would have been able to read and write. But he would not compare to those who trained as rabbis, like the Apostle Paul and, and obviously many others around him, the Pharisees, the scribes, and so on. And he probably followed, as we know, it was the case with James and John, in the footsteps of uh, his father, his father being a fisherman. And so in those days it would be a fairly normal practice for you to follow simply in the footsteps of your father and to take over the family business, uh, as it were. And it was... Uh, along the Sea of Galilee that Jesus found Peter ultimately and called him with several other fishermen uh, as well. Peter came from a village called Bethsaida, and uh, in John chapter 1 verse 44, that is mentioned in the Galilee province, and we'll look at a map in a moment, but he may have lived in Capernaum, and uh, even today when you visit Capernaum or visit Israel, one of the things you will do is to go to Capernaum and through excavations, archaeological digs, they have found a house that in tradition, and it's a very early tradition, was the house of Peter. That is in Capernaum. And we also know that Jesus was in the synagogue of Capernaum and the foundations of the, the synagogue that is there today uh, go back to the time of Jesus. Now, many other uh, walls have gone up in the meantime. Most of the ruins there date from the, the fourth century, perhaps. Um, but there are foundations that go back all the way to 2,000 years ago. And um, so somewhere along the line, it seems like Peter may have picked up and moved from Bethsaida to Capernaum. And when Jesus was in the synagogue in Capernaum, from the synagogue he went into the house of Peter, uh, and if you visit there today, it's not far. It's, it's literally uh, just a 50-meter uh, distance from the synagogue to the house that is indicated as the house of Peter uh, today, the ruins of that house, of course. Uh, on the northern side of uh, the Sea of Galilee, you will find this kind of picture. Um, now it's a very fertile uh, area, obviously irrigated with fresh water from the sea or the Lake of Galilee and and, and um, rain, etc., etc. The exact location of Bethsaida is no longer known, although different people have different places that they um, have ex excavated and then indicate as the place where Peter came from. And the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, according to BiblePlaces.com, is a fertile plain where the feeding of the 5,000 likely took place, and that particular spot is not, again, well known. Uh, 
although there is a likelihood that it may have been in, in a particular area where today you go and visit if you, uh, if you go to Israel. Israeli maps and excavators currently locate the New Testament city of Bethsaida at an ancient ruin known as Et Tel. The excavation team headed by Rami Araf uh, is insistent that this site be identified with ancient Bethsaida. Others, however, suggest that Bethsaida may be better located at El Araj near the lake shore. And so, again, just to, re to affirm or to confirm that the exact location of the Bethsaida of the New Testament is no longer uh, necessarily known. People have different views uh, on that. When it comes to the location of Bethsaida, you'll find on the left-hand side the, the map of Israel with the Dead Sea, and that little block there at the top is then uh, enlarged over here. And with the Sea of Galilee, where Tiberias uh, is located, and just to the north-northeast, uh, probably on the other side of the Jordan even, or, or close to the Jordan River, where the, where the Jordan flows into the Sea of Galilee, you will find um, what is Et Tel, or what some people indicate as Bethsaida. When it comes to Capernaum, and here is a photograph of some of the ruins, the, the walls of that particular synagogue uh, goes back to the 4th century or so, uh, so it doesn't go back all the way to Jesus, but when you go down into the foundations of this place, then it is likely that Jesus actually walked on those foundations. And this is the synagogue uh, in what was Capernaum. You'll see some ruins here in the front, and they literally represent some of the uh, older homes around what was maybe the town center uh, or the main center of Capernaum. The, most of the walls, as I said, date from the 4th century synagogue, uh, on the left, on the right-hand side, are Byzantine ruins of the village in the center, uh, which were the same area of the early Roman houses from the time of Jesus. In the background, past the walled area, are the pink capes of uh, now a Greek Orthodox church, and you will see that um, right there. So if you go there now, you'll find plenty of churches, old churches, many of them dating from the Middle Ages, uh, built in Israel, Israel all over the place, uh, many of them occupied by different traditions, Greek Orthodox or Roman Catholic or uh, Armenian and even Ethiopian Coptic and all those kind of people uh, who occupy uh, churches. But over what has become known as the ruins of Peter's house, you now have a church that is built over it and it's a fairly modern new church uh, with, a, with a center right in the middle, which is covered with glass, so you can walk around the center. In, you go inside the church, you walk around, as you go look down in, uh, over the center through a glass panel, uh, you can see the ruins of what people believe to be uh, Peter's house. Excavations revealed one residence that stood out from the others, uh, to quote from BibleWalks.com. This house was the object of early Christian attention with 2nd century graffiti and a 4th century house church built above it. In the 5th century, a large octagonal Byzantine church was erected above this, complete with a baptistry. Pilgrims refer to this as the house of the Apostle Peter, and, and so that is pointed out nowadays as the house of Peter. Again, to go back to the map, you'll find Capernaum, uh, if Bethsaida was at the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee, then Capernaum is on the left and uh, sort of northwestern uh, side uh, of uh, the Sea of Galilee. And so that gives you a bit of a picture of probably where Peter lived, and um, he would have worked fairly close to that, uh, the Sea of Galilee, as a fisherman. Peter's calling by Jesus is described in Matthew, also in John. Uh, he was led to Jesus by his brother, um, who eventually became the Apostle Andrew. A uh, very interesting uh, story that is told in John chapter 1, because Andrew was the one, he was a follower of John the Baptist. He heard John the Baptist speak about Jesus. He started following Jesus. And after a day in the presence of Jesus, Andrew thought that Jesus is the Messiah. And then he went and found his brother Peter, and he said to Peter, we have found him. At a later stage, or on another occasion, uh, Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Peter and Andrew, and he called them, and at the same time he also saw John and James, and he called them to follow him. The sequence of events not exactly clear, 
this is one of those things where you try and harmonize what we have in the Gospels. Uh, the one tells it from one angle, may tell of a particular incident, and the other one may tell from a, a different angle or another incident in the life of Jesus. Um, the sequence of those events not exactly clear always. But Peter became not only one of the twelve, um, and at one, on one occasion Jesus prayed for a whole night, and the next day out of a, a bunch of disciples, Jesus appointed twelve of them, and he called them apostles. And out of the twelve even, seems like Jesus drew close to three of them, uh, Peter, James, and John. And he, he drew them into an inner circle, if you wish. They were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, only those three. When Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus uh, from the dead, uh, it was those three that Jesus took into, uh, the, uh, into the room. And then when Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, uh, again, it was these three that he took with him and needed their support. So, um, interesting how Jesus had the crowds that he spoke to, sometimes 5,000 men or 3,000 men, uh, not even counting the women and children. And then there were the, the 70 or 72 that he sent out. So, there was a, a larger circle of disciples. And then there were the 12, the, most definitely the 12, and they were with him. And they continued the work into the book of Acts uh, with the early church, uh, with the other disciples as well. But then Jesus, it seems like, as a human, needed some very personal and intimate support from time to time. And Peter became one of those drawn into that inner circle to help Jesus and support him. He became known for his big mouth. Um, the story of Peter, you, you can read through the Gospels looking for Peter. That, that's one way you can read the Gospels. Uh, and just looking at the story of Peter, it really as it unfolds, uh, from being called by his brother Andrew, then being called by Jesus, uh, there's several occasions where Peter is at the forefront, either putting his foot in it uh, or uh, making a mess of it and denying Jesus and being restored uh, in John chapter 21. Uh, walking on the water. I mean, this is an amazing thing. When Jesus walked on the water, he is there walking on the water, and then he sinks. And you know, so it goes on in the life of Peter. He's, he really is an amazing man. I think so many of us can identify with Peter in his ups and downs almost. Uh, on the one hand, I will never deny you the, the previous night, the very next day. I don't know him. I, I've never seen him. You know, I, he even swears that he's never seen him. May, he may even have used some foul language just to sound as if he's not one of those Jesus kind of people. So that's, that's Peter. And so Peter has obviously had an amazing history and an experience with Jesus. And one can um, only imagine after he denied Jesus, uh, I think it's the Gospel of Luke who tells us that Jesus turned around and they made eye contact. And uh, I, I can't even imagine what must have gone through Peter's heart and mind when he, when he remembered three times. This has been the third time, and he makes his eye contact, and he went out, and he, he wept bitterly, says the gospel. He wept bitterly. And uh, I, I can only imagine, or try and imagine, what went through his heart and his life in those days where, before Jesus rose from the dead, and then maybe several more days before Jesus ultimately appeared to him. And then the story is told in, in John 21 where Peter went back fishing and the Jesus was on the shore. Now the resurrected Jesus. And that's where the conversation takes place where Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Three times. It's like the restoration of Peter. But then it's this same Peter who stands up on the day of Pentecost. Uh, now the Holy Spirit has come. And through thousands of people, uh, where previously in a small circle denying that he knew Jesus. Uh, now uh, in front of, uh, before thousands of people, he proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the restoration has taken place and Jesus used him uh, to proclaim the gospel. Um, from the day one almost in the book of Acts, it seems like Peter had this leadership gift um, while he was with Jesus. He's the one who speaks out often. And then after he was restored in John 21 in the book of Acts, it's almost a natural progression that Peter would be one of the leaders. And, and even Paul in Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 describes Peter as a leader, one of the leaders of the church in uh, Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting to note that that tradition still lives on in the Roman Catholic Church where they believe that the Pope is in the 
tradition and in the line of Peter. Peter is the apostle, um, and, and the Pope is the one who stands in that same uh, tradition. The first ten chapters of the book of Acts almost um, center around Peter as, as a person. Sometimes John is there, but John doesn't say much. In fact, I don't remember John actually saying anything, really. Um, we, we, we are told that, he, that they spoke, but it never says any of the words that, that John spoke. But we have a full sermon, a full-blown sermon in Acts chapter 2 from Peter. It is Peter who speaks to the Sanhedrin. Um, it is Peter who speaks to the lame man uh, at the temple. And uh, it is Peter who is regarded as a leader. It is Peter who receives the vision in Acts chapter 10 to go to Caesarea and, uh, and meet with a Roman a soldier and lead him to Christ. and In other words, to take the first step of taking the gospel to the Gentiles uh, as well. When we look at Peter beyond the book of Acts, and you will see in this picture uh, a man being, and this is a, a painting that someone made of Peter being crucified upside down. The last time we read about Peter in the book of Acts is in chapter 15, verses 7 to 11. Um, that's the council in Jerusalem. Uh, there is very little information about him after this particular time. As I said before, uh, uh, Paul refers to him in Galatians uh, chapter 2. Um, that must have been written slightly later. Um, so Peter is always around. And then um, in the Gospel of John chapter 21, uh, Jesus has an interesting uh, thing to say to Peter uh, which many people take as a reference to the death or the kind of death uh, that he would, would have died. And it says um, in verse 18, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. It's interesting uh, uh, that, that John writes that, and we, we looked at the dating of John and so on. John writes it in such a way that it looks like Peter has already died, this kind of death. Uh, that we cannot say with uh, any amount of certainty. But it does look like the kind of death that Peter died was going to glorify God. And uh, that was by way of execution, and according to a tradition, Peter traveled to Asia Minor, Hence, the letter that we will look that we are looking at is addressed to the region of Asia uh, or modern-day Turkey, and that somewhere along the line Peter was arrested and taken to Rome, and that he was crucified. And by his own request, he was. This is the tradition, and again, we have no way of verifying that. But he requested to be crucified upside down because he felt that he was not worthy to die in the same manner as his Christ, as his Lord Jesus. And so that's what you read, uh, and there's a quote from uh, Wikipedia. It's Clement of Rome in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5 that was written 80 to 98 somewhere, late first century, who speaks of Peter's martyrdom in the following terms. Let us take the noble examples of our own generation. Through jealousy and envy, the greatest and most just pillars of the church were persecuted and came even unto death. Peter, through unjust envy, endured not one but two, or two, but many labors, uh, persecutions that is, and at last, having delivered his testimony, departed unto the place of glory due to him. Now, that is just confirming that by this time he, he was dead. But traditions originating in or recorded in the apocryphal Acts of Peter, which is a book we don't have, in the New Testament, so we don't know how reliable that is. But um, this book says that the Romans crucified Peter upside down at his request because he did not wish to be equated with Jesus. So that takes us to, this is the background and the author of, of Peter. Uh, First Peter really is about um, suffering and responding to suffering. The recipients of Peter, as we go to First uh, Peter, once again, you will read, um, and we have started reading its typical letter style. And it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, 
scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And then he goes on into the body of the letter. Those regions uh, all refer to what is in modern day Turkey. Uh, we have actually looked at several maps in the past where we've looked at Galatia, the, same, the very same region that Paul wrote to. And Cappadocia was a, a neighboring province and Asia is the Asia Minor that we're talking to. So it seems like uh, Peter was writing a general letter. He uses a similar concept to that of James, and that is he uses the word scattered uh, or spread out. Um, and these are all the Christians everywhere, a concept well known to the Jews at the time, uh, and then through those particular provinces. So Peter's letter was intended as a circular. Uh, in other words, take this letter and read it in all of the churches, and uh, whether they made more copies immediately, we obviously won't be able to find out anymore. But those places mentioned in verse 1 were provinces of northern Asia Minor, uh, in, which is all in modern-day Turkey. As for the authorship of Peter, I promised that we would get back to this. Uh, the date of the persecution mentioned could have been as late as Domitian, uh, Emperor Domitian, or Domitianus uh, sometimes referred to, uh, in 81 and uh, all the way to 96. He heavily persecuted the Christians. It is under his rule that um, Revelation was probably written uh, by John, and we'll get back to that uh, next time. It can be Trajan, and that would take it as far as 112 to 117, but that, in my personal opinion, is way too far. But there is no reason why it couldn't have been the persecution under Nero, which is in the 60s. And we know that Nero uh, persecuted the Christians heavily, so the evidence is there, extra-biblical literature and all, uh, and also is the one who executed the Apostle Paul. And so there's no reason why Peter could not have written during that time. In fact, that would be my personal belief, is that he wrote uh, sometime under the persecution or during the time of the persecution under Nero. The Greek in 1 Peter, this is another argument that some people have, is, is too good. It's, it's good Greek, good language, good grammar, good style. And so the argument would be that it's too good for Peter to write as a simple fisherman to be able to write this kind of Greek. He would have been able to speak Aramaic pro probably fluently, even write it fluently. Uh, but there would be a question around the Greek language. It would be a second language, not commonly spoken in Judea uh, or in Galilee at the time. Uh, Peter would even have a bit of an accent. We know that from the, his denial, because one of the girls listened to him and said, you speak like a Galilean, you speak like someone from the north, as it were. And uh, so he would have had a bit of an accent like that. And, and so some scholars would say uh, he was too simple to write such good Greek as we have in First Peter. But again, there's no reason to doubt Peter's ability to speak and write the Greek, like many of us are bilingual, and some people here probably speak more than one language. Um, and it is not that difficult to master a new language uh, in a 10-year span, perhaps. Uh, and if Peter wrote this towards the end of his life, uh, he would have been able to spend a lot more time in Greek, um, the language Greek, uh, as he traveled in Asia Minor and other places. There's also another uh, bit of evidence that points to the fact that, uh, like Paul, Peter may have used a scribe rather than writing the material himself. It's like, with my Afrikaans background, uh, I may dictate a letter to one of you who's really, really good with English, uh, and you're meticulous in your grammar and your style and everything, and I may have a little broken English as I dictate the letter to you, your natural inclination would be to correct my language as you go along. You would write it down, but you wouldn't write down my mistakes. You would write down in good English because you know this letter is going to go out to all different kinds of people. And so when we go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, towards the end of the letter, the last few letters, it says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Now, the word for Silas here is uh, 
Silvanus, which is a, a variant of Silas. So the actual Greek word is Silvanus. So Peter is saying, with the help of Silvanus, I have written to you. What does he mean? Um, did Silvanus help him or Silas help him in his ministry? Well, it's one possibility. But it seems like in the direct and immediate context that, that Peter is really talking about someone who helped him write the letter. And so it's very likely or possible that, that Peter used Silvanus or Silas as a scribe, someone who is then able to write a lot better Greek than Peter himself would have been able to do. There's also a, a reference to Babylon. It says in verse 13, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now, there's an interesting comment, and we'll pick up on this again when we look at the book of Revelation. Babylon uh, was a symbolic reference. It's not the physical place called Babylon where the, peop the Jews went into exile. Babylon, over the years of Babylonian exile of the Jews back uh, four or five centuries earlier, uh, picked up the reputation of being opposed to the Jews. It's the evil city. So you want to refer to anything that's evil, you refer to the Babylon. Um, and, and we have similar ways of referring sometimes to either places or even individuals. Um, uh, we, we sometimes refer to a Jezebel. The Bible even refers to in Revelation to Jezebel. Now Jezebel goes all the way back to uh, Ahab, uh, the, the wife of Ahab. And she was an evil queen, an evil wife. And so the name Jezebel uh, really says there's something evil. And in a similar way, the word Babylon, in the New Testament in particular, picked up this reputation of being an evil place. Also, in the book of Revelation, Babylon is used as an evil city. But it really refers to probably, maybe I should say, it probably refers to the city of Rome. And it's covered language. It's symbolic language. You don't say Rome is against you but Rome being an evil place or an evil city. Now, if Peter wrote during the time of Nero, Nero representing evil and persecution and Nero dominating Rome, and so in Peter's mind, this is, this is Babylon. This is the Babylon. And so he's writing to these churches and saying, uh, she who is in uh, Babylon, she uh, brings you greetings. Peter also wrote to an audience where Paul was the respected leader. Um, in other words, we're really talking about all of those missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, where he spends a huge amount of time in Asia Minor, uh, in Ephesus and other places like that, Galatia. And, and Peter is writing to the same crowd. So the question is, how can Peter, who was not that well known, write to a place where Paul was the recognized apostle? Um, that is not a strong argument because... Peter would have been regarded as a leader in the church. Even Paul recognized Peter as a leader in Jerusalem of the church, of the early church. And so in that sense, Peter would have had the right and the authority uh, and would be well known in the, in the new churches uh, as someone who could write to the churches worldwide. Some of the themes and the message that we find in 1 Peter, uh, one of the major themes in the letter is that of persecution and suffering. Now, that theme comes through again and again, uh, even as early as in chapter 1. Uh, it says, Praise be to the garden, uh, verse 3, the garden father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. You see the emphasis? something that cannot be taken away from you. Persecution can take everything away from you, material, but it cannot take away from you your eternal life. And this is kept for you in heaven. So even as Peter starts the letter, he, he, his attempt is to put the emphasis, the perspective where it needs to be. The perspective and the emphasis we need is not on this material world. Um, and I heard someone say just recently that it, nobody can take away from you what, you what you've already given away. Now, nobody can take, if you have given your life to Jesus, then nobody can take your life anymore because it doesn't belong to you anymore. And it's a, it's a wonderful perspective, really, when you come to think of it. It's, um, it's those things that we keep and we hold on to. Those are the things that people will be able to take away from us. But if we've given it away, given it up, 
then nobody can take it away. And that's the perspective of Peter over here, right as he starts. It comes down in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice in, in, in everything that is kept for you. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And he will go on in chapter 2, verse 19, and chapter 3, uh, all the way to chapter 4, verse 19. Peter goes on to talk about this suffering, oftentimes making the comparison between our suffering and Jesus' suffering. We will suffer because Jesus suffered, but our suffering is nothing compared to his, and, and so on. And so other themes that we find in 1 Peter include our status before God. As we started uh, tonight, I highlighted that in chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, we are a new people and a holy priesthood and a, a royal priesthood. Uh, we, uh, he also highlights the concept of holiness. He, he talks about that in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. But just as he who, ha who you called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Again, Peter reaches back into the Old Testament to a concept that Israel was very familiar with. And that is, we need to be holy, we need to be different, we need to be separate, we need to be special. And uh, Peter applies that to our Christian lives, uh, using the, the concept of being holy. Family life in chapter 3, uh, talking about wives and husbands and how they relate to one another. This is nothing different from one of the things that the Apostle Paul also highlighted. Uh, again, emphasizing the fact that as Christians, um, our, our Christianity, our faith in God impacts every aspect of life. There is no such a concept in the Bible that we worship God on a Sunday or for Israel on the Sabbath and during the week we do whatever we like. There's no dichotomy like that in the Bible. It's one life. It's a life belonging to God. Uh, Peter also has a lot to say about elders. Uh, in chapter 5, to the leaders, to the elders among you. I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings and one who always also uh, will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples uh, to the flock. And so those are some of the themes that we find uh, in First Peter. By way of an outline, chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 10, we find the suffering as Christians. Um, and, and woven into that is the new birth. We have been born into a new life. Um, there's the holy living that we refer to, those living stones that I referred to earlier on and have read at the beginning of our time together. Chapter 2, verse 11 starts a new section uh, where he talks about us as strangers in the world. Again, the concept of holiness comes to the fore. Submission, submission to one another, to authority, relationships, doing good. And then in chapter 3, verse 13, again starting a new section, the purpose of suffering, which is following Jesus and, and living in such a way that we focus on the future glory. Um, there, there's a future awaiting us. This life is not it. It's preparation for what is really coming ultimately. And then in chapter 5, we started reading the guidelines for leaders and then the final greetings right at the end of the letter. So that gives us a breakdown uh, of the letter. What's Peter's purpose as he's writing? He actually states it in chapter 5, verse 12. He says, With the help of Silas, or Silvanus, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Stand in the grace. Uh, it's, it's about steadfastness. Uh, steadfastness. Uh, knowing that um, this life and the suffering that we endure is not it. Uh, there, there's a life beyond this, and in that we need to stand. Uh, that is the grace of God. We have received the grace of God, and by the grace of God, He will also help us to continue. The recipients were going through major suffering and persecution. There are horrific stories told about Nero uh, putting uh, human bodies, Christians, live human bodies into uh, sex, uh, dipping them in some kind of a tar and then setting them alight on a pole so that it can provide some light as he drives uh, to his palace and uh, all sorts of horrific stories told about Nero and the persecution. And so many Christians were suffering uh, tremendously under uh, this 
time of persecution. And Peter was writing to them to endure, encouraging them to stand firm uh, despite all the persecution that they were going through. Now, they could only do this if they believed in the message of the future, if they believed in the true message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what he says in chapter 1. Uh, he reminded them of the practical implications of the gospel message. They are pilgrims, they are uh, people on a journey, we are strangers in this world. He actually uses that concept. This is, this is, in a certain sense, not our world. As much as we live in this world right now, and from other Bible passages, we need to understand that we, we're not trying to remove ourselves from this world. We're in this world. But there's a certain sense in which we don't belong to this world. We belong to another world. We live in this world, but belong to another. And uh, that was helping them to endure. It's difficult for us uh, if we're not in a persecution kind of stage of life uh, or, or circumstance, uh, for us to even begin to think like this. But when Christians, and this has been true throughout the Christian history, when they are being persecuted, oftentimes their thoughts are far more on the future and the eternal life and, and heaven than, than we live with that same reality. And uh, perhaps we should be living more with that reality of eternity that is awaiting us. And Christ is the one they should be following. Uh, Jesus was the one who suffered. He set the example. He, uh, in a certain sense, He set the pattern. And Peter is saying, we should follow Jesus in our suffering. Uh, we should not complain when we suffer, but actually follow Jesus and be faithful to Him. A few uh, gems in, in Peter that I want to highlight. Um, he talks about election. It's a major doctrine that uh, is controversial for many people, but he says to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered through those provinces, we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Here is a, a mystery. God is beyond time and above time. And so in God's knowledge, He knows about who is going to be His people. So in that sense, it's not, it's not difficult to explain the election, that God, in His foreknowledge, can elect. And when people are in Christ, they are the elect of God. And that's the confirmation that we have again and again in the Bible. Holiness is something I highlighted. Chapter 2, verse 9. The new people of God, which is really an extension, uh, a continuation of the Old Testament. And then advice to the leaders, which I've already highlighted. Some of the application, the challenges before us, is how do we handle suffering and what is the kind of suffering? For us, probably it's more subtle rather than physical because we have religious freedom in our country. Um, and so, what, what is the kind of suffering? For some people, it is family uh, who oppose them. Uh, if you are from a different religion, like a Muslim person, and you come to faith, uh, right here in South Africa, you will face major persecution by your family, rejection even. And uh, for most of us, it's not that. Uh, but how do we respond to suffering? And then what do we learn from Peter regarding the church? Uh, think about chapter 2, verse 9, and think about the concept of leadership. It's interesting. The Bible never takes, the New Testament never takes the concept of leadership away. But it does place a huge amount of emphasis a, a, a more emphasis on the ownership by everybody. And that is the gifts, for example, in Paul. He talks about the different gifts. Every one of us is differently gifted. And we need to participate in the church of Jesus. And when you read second, uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, and you talk about a royal priesthood, we don't need a priest. Jesus is our high priest. That we saw last week in Hebrews, for example. And um, uh, it, it, it helps us to understand who we are our status before God, but it also um, helps us to understand that we have a responsibility. Each one of us has a responsibility to participate in the body of Christ. Leads us to Second Peter, and uh, Second Peter is really responding to false uh, teachings. Their, their major themes uh, in the New Testament, one of which we just looked at, uh, is one of several, but it is the concept of persecution and suffering and how we must endure. We'll pick up, we'll pick up on that again uh, in some of the other letters. Uh, and more specifically, when we get to Revelation, the concept or the background of persecution is strong in the book of Revelation. But here in Second Peter, 
we have another one of the major themes in the letters, and that is false doctrines or how we need to approach false teachings. And uh, that's one thing that Second Peter is highlighting. And in that sense, he is very similar to the book of Jude, which we will be doing towards the end of the lecture time uh, today. When it comes to the authorship of Second Peter, according to some scholars, there, there are many issues in Second Peter that we may want to look at and uh, actually debate. For example, the Greek is very different. Now, we looked at 1 Peter, the Greek is good. You look at 2 Peter, the Greek is not good. Um, it is like, is it the same person who really wrote these two things? Uh, and so, obviously, that has led to some debate among scholars. The similarities between 2 Peter, chapter 2, uh, and the book of Jude, and we'll look at Jude later on, but they are very, very similar in feel, in language, um, not necessarily verbatim quoting one another, but it seems like there's a very similar tradition behind that. And that has raised the whole issue about copying. Was uh, one copying the other? The title, Simeon Peter, as I said before, uh, looks very different to that of First Peter, where it's only Peter. Uh, and again, Peter, uh, people say, why would he introduce himself with a different name uh, if it's the same author? And then there are issues around the delayed return of Jesus. In chapter 3, verse 4, let me read verse 3. It says, First of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Now, again, you need to understand that the early church lived with an anticipation and expectation that Jesus was going to come in their time. So the longer, every year that went by, it was almost a year of disappointment, if you wish. It was saying, now, where is his return? And then there are those who begin to say, ah, oh, it doesn't look like this is ever going to happen. Maybe this whole thing is false anyway. And so that was part of the argument, and Peter is responding to that. So, some scholars are saying, Peter has lived on, in fact, it's probably not Peter who writes, this may be the second century already, and some people are arguing, so where is the second coming? Because we're in the second century, and uh, then someone needed to pick up a pen and write to address that whole issue. So obviously it comes from the second century. Hence the argument, or so goes the argument. How do we respond? Well, you, you would find difficulty getting around the self-claim of the author and the fact that the early church accepted this letter very early on as being written by the Apostle Peter. Uh, and in the letter itself, Peter claims, or the author claims, that he was an eyewitness. The letter suggests that Peter at the time of writing was older, uh, hence the so-called later developments. And you'll pick that up in, in chapter 1, verse 14. It says, because I know that I will soon um, put, put it aside, that's our, uh, let, me, let me go back to chapter uh, 1, verse 13. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the, in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. In other words, he's anticipating, like Paul in 2 Timothy, he's expecting to die soon. So he's older, and so obviously time has gone on. And so that would uh, explain some of the so-called later developments. He claimed to have been an eyewitness in chapter 1, verse 16. We did not, did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty, for, we received, for He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. And Peter is referring here, to the Mount of Transfiguration or the experience of Transfiguration. He refers to Paul as a colleague. Um, later on, at, towards the end of the book, he talks about Paul who writes in all of his letters, chapter 3, verse uh, 16. And then also he mentions a previous letter. Dear friends, in chapter 3, verse 1, this is now my second letter to you. So when you read it that way, you, you would be hard pushed to really uh, find an alternative author than the Apostle Peter uh, in this book. Let's look at the uh, recipients of Second Peter. Uh, Peter writes to those who through the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. 
Now, that does not tell us anything about the recipients. And so ultimately we'll have to say that we simply just don't know uh, who, to whom he is writing. Um, when it comes to an outline, I'll put all of that uh, on the screen. It says, um, we, we look at the opening remarks, we, uh, the need for holiness, Scripture and Revelation, and then the major portion of this book is chapter 2, the opposing of the false teachers, and that's a, a major theme. And then he talks about the last days and the day of the Lord, a concept we have already picked up from the prophets uh, earlier on. And um, right now we're going to take a, a tea break, and then we'll finish uh, Second Peter uh, just after the tea break. Okay, as we look at Second Peter, the purpose and the message, we find Peter responding to false teachers going around. And more specifically, when you get into chapter 2 of Second Peter, you'll find him talking specifically about false teachers. I'm not going to elaborate a lot now because there's much of this that we find in the book of Jude as well. And when we get there a little bit later on, we'll look at that. But the way that, that Peter approaches that is by talking about Christian growth that produces fruit and stability. And one of the ways in which you can recognize what is false is by knowing what is true. If you don't know what is true, you won't be able to understand what is false. Um, and, and so, it's not just Peter, but, but in, in all of the scriptures, this is the emphasis more specifically in the letters of Paul and now here in Peter as well. Uh, the more you put your roots down, the more you, you, need, you get to know God, the more you get to know God's Word, the more you will have an ability to recognize what is false that comes your way. And so God's Word and promises are true, he says, and um, he's definitely living in Second Peter at a time where there's an accusation that Jesus is not going to come back. And so the so-called postponement of the second coming, Peter addresses by saying, you know, actually God is beyond time uh, because a thousand years is like one day, one day like a thousand years. So God's timing may be way beyond our brains, our, our ability to comprehend what God is doing in terms of timing. So we should not think time. Even 2,000 years for us is nothing. If you, if you quote Peter, then only two days have passed. Uh, because for God, it's nothing. Whether there's 2,000 years, 2,000 days, or one day, uh, it is besides the point. God has a time and a time program, and He will keep to that. Uh, there's the warning against the teaching and the false prophets and the focus on the end times uh, here in Second Peter. When we look at uh, a quick application uh, of... Second Peter, those, who have, those of us who grew up in a Christian uh, legalistic environment, uh, we have sort of moved on. Um, some of us have grown up in a very strict environment, do this, don't do that. A Christian uh, doesn't do this and a Christian does that. Um, so it's, it's fairly legalistic in its approach with very, very good intention. And that is, that is what sin is. You need to avoid that. And it's named. And then this is what a holy person does. Now, there's the danger that one may get away from and be released from a legalistic approach uh, to Christianity, but then anything and everything goes to the point where uh, you, you're not distinguishable from the sinful world out there. And so there's a real danger. It's, it's, a, it's almost living on the edge, as it were, on, on a knife edge, uh, knowing when not to become legalistic, but also knowing when to say no to certain things because they are evil and they will uh, take your focus away from God. And then the false prophets of our time. If you come back uh, and do the fourth module, we're going to look at major doctrines within the Bible and every time we'll look at false doctrines related to that, actual uh, examples of false teachings. And uh, most of those are not uh, far away from us. Most of those are not actually far away in history even. They are real and they are, they are present and they are uh, endangering our Christian faith even in our world today. So right here in South Africa, we are not free from false teachings that are doing the rounds. And then the second coming. I think reading Peter and reading about those postponement, uh, it is not easy for me daily and I'm not sure about you, but 
but on a daily basis to think second coming, to think that Jesus may come back. He may come back today. He may come back in, in, in a week's time or in a month's time or in a thousand years' time. Um, we, we don't know the date. But uh, is it still a reality, though? Do we live with that sort of expectation in our hearts that Jesus is going to come back? So that's First and Second Peter. It takes us to the letters of John. Letters from the Beloved Disciple. And uh, even in that title you will see um, that I have a firm belief that John, the author of the Gospel of John, is also the author of First, Second, and Third John. There are three wonderful books full of guidance and advice for Christians. Uh, the first letter is more general in content and addresses, whereas the other two seem to have a specific address. Uh, when you go to First John, the introduction is is simple. It looks almost like John, and it almost looks like Hebrews, uh, so there's a fair amount of similarity. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Uh, and you'll find so many of the concepts in First John going back to the Gospel of John. And um, just in reading it, the, the word... Uh, the, from the beginning, the word beginning is there, the word word is there, the word of life and, and so on, the word life is there, the word light is there, and, and so on. The, those words you will find again and again in First John, uh, proving the fact that uh, we're looking here at probably the same author as that of John, the Gospel of John. And also, I said to you earlier, there are five chapters in um, First John, when you go to 2nd and 3rd John, they are very short little books. Only one chapter, uh, each one of those. But they look a lot more like letters. For example, 2nd John, the elder. In other words, that's the author announcing himself. The elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth. 3rd John uh, says, the elder, again that's the author, to my friend Gaius whom I love in the truth. So that's far more letter style than we have in 1st John. 2nd um, John is the shortest book in the New Testament, by the way. Um, just uh, 13 verses, but even in terms of the wording, um, you will find that it's uh, shorter. In terms of authorship, um, there is not a name attached to any one of these letters. 2nd uh, and 3rd John mention the elder, but it's not identified by name. It sounds like it may have become a, a, a sort of a uh, a loving way of referring to John at that particular time and he's probably a little bit older and he's picked up this name, um, this almost nickname of being the elder, the loving elder, the person who looks after uh, the church. Uh, there is no doubt when you look at First John that the person, the author is talking about himself as an eyewitness, what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, we now proclaim to you. And he repeats that. Uh, to make sure that people understand he was there and what he has touched about the word of life he is now conveying to his uh, recipients, to the, those who are reading it. Uh, the early church ascribed all the letters to John the Apostle. And uh, we would, again, have no real argument against that, uh, certainly not 2,000 years later. Uh, the early church very strongly affirmed the fact that John uh, was this... Uh, was, was the author. And that goes for the early church fathers such as First Clement, uh, the Didache, which is a teaching book in the second century, and uh, Papias Polycarp, and they're all uh, in the second century, so they're close to the time when John would have written these books. Um, when it comes to a comparison between John the Gospel and the letters of John, the language, the style, the content found in 1, 2, and 3 John are strikingly similar. Um, even when you, read the, when you read the Greek, it's one of the books that we use to introduce students to Greek because it's easy Greek and the, and the words are repeated over and over. Uh, when we studied the Gospels, I think I told you that John uses a limited number of words in terms of vocab physical vocabulary, um, much less than Luke, for example. But the meaning that he attaches to those words is deep and theological, far more uh, than some of the others would do. And we find the same kind of style and vocabulary uh, in 1st, 2nd, uh, and 3rd John, more particularly 
uh, 1 John helps us in this regard. From this information, it's not difficult to see why the church has ascribed it to John. And as I said to you, we have no reason to doubt that uh, whatsoever. When it comes to the person of John, the Apostle John is well known to us from the Gospel stories. He's uh, often referred to as the beloved disciple. Again, there's no direct indication that he is it, but uh, it is the beloved disciple who writes the Gospel of John. And the early church tradition assigned uh, John's name or uh, attached John's name to that of the beloved disciple and as the author of the Gospel of John. And in that sense, we would, be, uh, we would have the same person writing over here. Like Peter, fisherman, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, and he was called at the same time as Peter. If you go back to Matthew chapter 4, you can read the story of Jesus walking by the side uh, of the Sea of Galilee, and he saw these uh, people, first uh, the one a couple of brothers, a set of brothers, and then the other set as well, and called all four of them, and they, they, all four of them left their father and their, their um, uh, equipment and followed uh, Jesus. To what extent that happened, we, uh, I mean, physically leaving everything, sounds like by the end of it all, when Jesus was crucified and they were still wondering about the resurrection, uh, Peter in chapter 21 of John said, let's go fishing again. So the equipment was still there. They still owned the business, perhaps, but they left it all at the time to follow Jesus. And whether they were 24-7, 12 months a year with Jesus or not, that again is debatable. We don't know. It may have been, but they may have gone back from time to time to do the job that they used to be doing. But James and John were given the nickname uh, Boanerges, uh, or Sons of Thunder, by Jesus in Mark chapter 3, verse 17. We have no idea what, why that is. Both of them really come across, especially John, come across as the beloved disciple, the, the gentle one. So why he would be given this name, son, or they be given this name, sons of thunder, we don't know. It was the two of them, however, who wanted to call down fire from heaven to devour a Samaritan city at one stage. So maybe that was part of the reason why they picked up this uh, name. But John was another of the close companions. Uh, we talked about Peter, the inner circle, uh, those three of them, and John was one of them, and also regarded as a leader uh, in the early church, although not as prominent in terms of speaking and preaching, at least in terms of the record we have as uh, Peter. When it comes to John the Apostle, in other words, the later life of John, he does not feature as prominently in Acts, as I said. Uh, he apparently stayed in Jerusalem, for the early part of the church's existence, uh, when the church was scattered after the persecution that broke out, uh, when Stephen was murdered, uh, he, the apostle stayed in Jerusalem, but it seems like he stayed longer than some of the others. At a later stage, perhaps in the 60s, he left Jerusalem, it sounds like, or seems like, before the fall of Jerusalem. Certainly in, in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed, so by that time, the apostles would have been scattered around the world uh, anyway. Um, but tradition has it that he stayed in Ephesus. He went to Ephesus, the same city where Paul established a church uh, for two and a half years long in uh, Acts chapter 19. We read about that. But John stayed in Ephesus and became the pastor of this church and um, there's a strong tradition about this, and that from this particular city, he was then um, persecuted, uh, arrested, and sent across to Patmos from where he then wrote the book of Revelation. And that would happen in the 90s. So we're now talking about an old, old man, uh, probably in his late 80s or something uh, by the time he wrote this, or maybe early 80s when he wrote the book of Revelation. Most conservative scholars believe that he died mid to late 90s uh, AD. In terms of the writing, uh, the date and the writing of John's letters, uh, we have no way of really dating these books. Um, it is virtually impossible to determine the date. Uh, it could have been later in John's life, uh, rather than during the, the early part of his Jerusalem ministry, perhaps during the Ephesian-type ministry, when we know that he put together the book that we now know as Revelation. First John, the book of First John, in one single word, can be summarized as being fellowship, or koinonia is the Greek word that some of us probably have learned to, uh, uh, to use as well. But the book is about fellowship. It's about fellowship with God, and it's about fellowship with one another. 
In fact, John introduces that after he spoke about what they've seen and heard and so on. He says, the life appeared, we have seen it, we testify to it, we proclaim to you uh, in, chapter, in, in verse 3, uh, to you what we've seen and heard, so that, you may also, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we write this to make our joy or your joy complete. So right at the start, he tells us what his purpose is, and that is fellowship. Now when it comes to recipients, there's, again, no indication of to whom John is writing. Um, whereas Peter at least gives us an indication of a circular to many churches in modern-day Turkey and those provinces of, of Asia at the time. But it is almost impossible to, to determine the recipients of this particular letter. It's even difficult to conclude from the content whether he's writing to a non-Jewish or a Jewish audience. Um, it could be either. Uh, one could, in some cases you could say there may be a, a, a Judaism sort of background or a knowledge of the Old Testament required, but that's not essential in order to understand 1 John. Uh, whereas Hebrews, for example, it's almost essential to have a bit of Old Testament knowledge. But in this particular case, uh, that is not so. The book reads like a treatise, uh, similar to that of Hebrews. We've looked at Hebrews last week, um, a sermonic um, letter or epistle, we called that one. Uh, this can fall almost into the same category. But there is also a personal relationship between the author John and the audience, whoever the recipients were. Uh, he refers to them as children or dear children. So he, he's, he's speaking to them, almost a sermon that he preaches to them, uh, but in writing to them. And they are friends also in chapter 2, uh, verse 7. So there really seems to be uh, a very good relationship. When we look at a, a brief outline of First John, as I said to you, this word fellowship or quinonia uh, is a very, very important one that, that you can pick up uh, sometimes between the lines, but most of the time, this is what it's about. It's our fellowship with God and our fellowship with one another. What establishes this fellowship? And in the first part of the book, he talks about our fellowship between one another as believers and our fellowship is with God. And it's knowing God, and he uses many different words uh, to explain this concept of fellowship or koinonia. Uh, knowing God is one of those, or knowing one another proclaiming Jesus Christ or uh, acknowledging Jesus Christ. There are many different words that he uses uh, for this. And then in the second part of the book, he talks about the threat of our fellowship with God, our quinonia. I'll give you an idea. Chapter 2, verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. That is a threat to our fellowship with God as well as a fellowship with one another. So this is John's angle to the false prophecies. Um, and he calls them Antichrist or Antichrist, and which is the only way where we find this word, by the way. We don't find it anywhere else uh, written in the Bible. But it's, it's what threatens our fellowship with God is the Antichrist. And what establishes our fellowship with God is the anointing of God. And it's uh, interesting in Greek, and you will hear the word, uh, even when I say it, Antichristos is the Antichrist, you can hear that. But the anointing that he refers to in the same passage is Chrisma. And so you can hear the, the, almost the play on word, Antichristos, as opposed to Chrisma. And he says, what helps you to stand fast? What, what prevents you from following the Antichrist? It is the Chrisma, the anointing of God that is upon you. And uh, of course, then one's got to go and interpret what he means by that. And when you then go on to chapter 4 and 5, those last two chapters, John talks about the true signs of fellowship. And he alternates between faith, believing in God, acknowledging God, proclaiming God, um, or Jesus, and it's mostly Jesus, who He is and what He's come to do, that He's come in the flesh and that He is God. John has some of the clearest statements about Jesus' divinity than anywhere else in the Bible. And then... That's the faith that we have in Jesus, and then the love that we have for one another. How do I know that you're a Christian? Well, number one, I look for faith in Jesus. That's what John is saying. Number two, I look at whether you have love for one another. So it's fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. 
And those two signs, and he alternates between that. You can, you can look at that uh, in chapter 4, how uh, the, the, the whole section in the NIV is, is titled, uh, entitled, Test the Spirits. Uh, and he says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. That's about our faith in God. How do we know what the, the false teachings are about? It's by knowing God. Then in, in verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another. And so oftentimes, 1 John has been called the book of love um, and, or the letter of love. And, and as much as I agree with the theme of love in the book, I believe it's more the fellowship with God of which love is an expression of our fellowship uh, with God that John is highlighting. In terms of the purpose and the message of John, First John, he states his purpose. I said it already, and that is that we may have communion, fellowship, uh, koinonia rather, fellowship with the Father and with His Son, and our fellowship is with one another, and so that we can have joy. Now, when our fellowship with God is in place, and we have fellowship with, with one another, there's nothing that will take your joy away. And joy is not smiling all the time. Joy is an inner joy that will well up the, regardless of what is happening in your life. It's a joy that no one can take away from you. It's an inner joy. Then, uh, the book can be summarized in that word fellowship, as I said before, in terms of purpose. The goal of the fellowship, uh, of our relationship with God, is to have true fellowship with Him and also with one another. And this is threatened. This fellowship, sin, threatens our relationship with God. We know this so well, but let me read it to you. If we claim to be without sin, chapter 1, verse 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins as our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him to be, uh, out to be a liar and His word is, has no place in our lives. So what threatens our fellowship? Sin. How do you deal with sin? You confess it. And then He is faithful, faithful and He will forgive your sins. So confession, repentance, reestablishes your relationship with God. So we're in this fellowship with God. It is threatened by sin. It's threatened by the Antichrist. In other words, false teachings and other things. Um, but we have someone who is uh, interceding for us. In fact, John is the one who really helps us in this regard. He says in, in chapter 2, verse 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Because sin breaks your fellowship with God. But I write that you do not sin. However... If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It is a marvelous truth that right now, at this point in time, I have Jesus with the Father. And if I confess my sins, John chapter, 1 John 1 verse 9, we know so well. We often use it in evangelism. But really, it applies to you and me. It applies to the Christian who sins, really. That's the context. And if we do sin, then we go to Jesus, we confess, we repent, and Jesus intercedes for us, and He forgives, and, and He brings us into the presence of God. He is the one through whom our fellowship with God is restored. I need to stop preaching and go on. Uh, the key concepts in 1 John is fellowship with God, fellowship with Christians, other Christians, our love for God and our love for one another, our faith in Jesus Christ as God and the one who came in the flesh. Now, John was obviously also looking at it, and we need to read that between the lines. Uh, sometimes it, it is very clear what John is saying. Other times between the lines. There is a false teaching going around, either that Jesus is not God, that He became God, or he was regarded as God, but he was really just a human being. Or he was God, and he became he, he came into this world, but he only had the appearance of a human body. He didn't have a real human body. John addresses both, and he says, no, you've got to believe that Jesus is God. You also need to believe that he came in the flesh. That's the literal translation of the Greek. Both of them. Now, that led to the church, and we'll look at this in more detail in, this, in the last module. That led to the church making the statement, the confession, um, the statement of faith, that we believe in the two natures of God, God is, uh, of Jesus. Jesus is at the same time 
divine, in other words, God, and human. Uh, he's unique. Nobody else has that feature or that characteristic. And, and that is primarily because of the way John said it. And John says you deny either of those and you break fellowship with God. Fellowship, again, see the word, the koinonia, with God and with one another. John is the one who helps us with some important teachings around the Antichrist. I'm not going to elaborate tonight. We'll uh, pick that up again in the last module when we talk specifically, and this, we'll discuss this specifically, who and what is the Antichrist. But we pick this up uh, when we looked at uh, uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. I referred to that, and many scholars, most scholars, make the connection between the man of lawlessness in Second Thessalonians and the Antichrist here in John. And again, to reiterate that in John is the only one who uses this particular term of Antichrist. The others, uh, we have to deduct or make the connection uh, as it were. And then true children of God can be identified by their faith and love. Let me go over to Second John, short little book. It won't take us long uh, to even read it. The writing is by the elder, probably a loving title for John by this time. Um, and he is writing to the chosen lady and her children. This is more likely than not uh, a reference, a symbolic reference to the church or a church. And we don't know which one. If it is a church, we don't know which one. But it may even be the church in general, where John is simply writing to the church. Now, when you go through the letter, he says to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. And then, typical letter writing style, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Interesting, he mentions truth and love. And when you go back to 1 John, faith and love, and you can say truth and love, those are two major concepts in John. One is what we believe about God, the truth about God. That results in love for God, but also love for one another. So those two concepts, faith and love, actually prove that we belong to God. You don't believe the truth, you're not a real Christian. You don't love your brother, you don't love God, you're not a true Christian. That's essentially what John is saying, and he repeats that uh, to a large extent here in Second John as well. Now, as I said, some um, people refer or, or take this reference to the lady. He says, the chosen lady and her children, as a reference to a church. Uh, if it is, then... We don't know which church or what church he's talking about. And some believe that he may have written to a specific church and, and maybe to a specific woman who, who um, accommodated a church uh, in her house. But again, we can't be more uh, um, specific about that and, and be too emphatic about it. The purpose and message of John, very clear. It's love and truth. Uh, I've mentioned that already. Uh, verses 4 to 5, uh, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one you have from the beginning. I ask you that you love one another. So those two themes come through very strongly uh, here in verse 6. And further, he talks about uh, the love. Um, and then he talks about false teachers as well, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. You see the term? They deny that Jesus came in the flesh. They deny that Jesus was a real man, a human being. And he says, if you do, you're denying the truth. Any such per person is the, dece the deceiver and the antichrist. Interesting. The, who's the antichrist? Someone who denies, just quoting this verse, someone who denies that Jesus came in the flesh. Someone ultimately who denies that Jesus is God who denies that Jesus is the Christ. If you do, you're the Antichrist. That's essentially what John is saying uh, in this particular context. Uh, the letter is almost a brief summary of what we have found in 1 John. And when you go to 3 John, uh, it's, it's a commendation of a Christian friend. And uh, this time the elder is saying, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Uh, 
Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. This little letter was also written by the elder, the same as 2 John, the addressee, my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth, um, may have been a real person. In fact, the way it reads seems to be indicate that you're talking about a real person. But we have no idea who this Gaius was or where he lived or anything more about his background. So we just need to accept that John had a contact with this friend of his by the name of Gaius, and we happen to have that little letter uh, in our Bible. The purpose and the message, John commends Gaius. Now, the, the way that he does it, and I, have, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but he says, I pray that you may enjoy good health, physical health, and that all may go well with you, even as you are spiritually doing well. Now, normally we would put it the other way around. Normally we would say, I hope spiritually you're doing as well as you're doing physically. But John says to Gaius, it seems like Gaius was really doing well spiritually. And he's saying, I hope that bodily, physically, you will do as well as you're doing spiritually. Now, that's quite a, a commendation. Gaius was commended for his hospitality as you go on. Uh, he's faithful. He, uh, he accommodated certain people, but is also warned against the evil practices of a certain Diotrephus. And uh, uh, the identity, the activities of this particular Diotrephus, we have no way of establishing uh, anymore. But that's the purpose for why he's writing. He says, uh, dear friend, in verse 11, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Uh, we, we don't know the identity of these people mentioned, Gaius, uh, Diotrephus, or Demetrius, uh, and so we have no way of establishing more of the background. Takes us to the last letter uh, in the New Testament. Although Revelation sometimes reads like a letter, we find letters in um, the, the book of Revelation, but in terms of letters addressed by some of the apostles to certain people and so on, uh, the general letters, this is the last one that we'll look at. Jude, standing strong against false teachers. The author introduces himself as Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Typical letter writing style with the author, the recipients, and greetings. Now, when it comes to the identity of Judas, like James, we're in a certain amount of trouble because he doesn't tell us exactly who it is, although he gives us more indication. He does say, servant of Jesus Christ, that's fairly common, but then he says, a brother of James. So, it seems like if we have already identified James as a sibling of Jesus, then it makes sense to then believe that you're now talking about another sibling of Jesus by the name of Judas. Now, in the New Testament, there are at least four people by this name. There's Judas Iscariot. There's Judas, another one of Jesus' apostles. There is Judas Barsabas, who accompanied Paul for a little while. Um, we read about him in Acts chapter 15, a very unlikely candidate. Uh, Judas Iscariot, definitely not. I think that we can say. Um, and then Judas, a brother, sibling of Jesus, and we read his name in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Church tradition has it. The early church identified this last person primarily, I guess, because of his own identification as a brother of James. So he's not the Judas apostle, but actually another Judas, and that's the sibling of Jesus. While many modern and more liberal scholars doubt the authenticity of this letter, um, then Wikipedia makes this comment, which I would uh, endorse. More remarkable is the evidence that by the end of the second century, Jude was widely accepted as canonical. Clement, Tertullian, and the Muratorian canon considered the letter as canonical. So as early as a, a year, just over a year after this letter was written, it was, uh, sorry, not a year, a hundred years, uh, after that, this letter was already accepted as canonical. Many modern scholars would doubt that. They point out some of the difficulties of the 
relationship between Second Peter 2 and Jude uh, and several other things, and they would not accept it for that reason, but we have very little problem in accepting it. When it comes to Judas as a person, um, or Jude, um, that's a, an abbreviated form or a different version, a variant of Judas, it seems that he was the brother of Jesus, that he came to faith in Christ, in Jesus. We don't know, like in James's case, precisely when. That story is never told to us. Uh, but somewhere around the resurrection of Jesus, probably, uh, or after the resurrection of Jesus, he became a Christian. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we may have a reference to this particular Judas. He may have been in that group of people who met in the upper room, uh, because there's a reference to the mother and the brothers of Jesus. Uh, maybe worthwhile just, just turning there and looking at that reference, uh, just in case you wonder. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. They all join together, and there's the name, the list of, of the apostles. And then in verse 14, they all join together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, that's an interesting comment. So, James and Jude would have been in this company of people in the upper room, praying and waiting, and ultimately receiving the Holy Spirit. And so, Somewhere, either before or after the death and resurrection of Jesus, they became followers of Jesus. They started believing that Jesus was really uh, the Messiah. There are other references to him in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, uh, and 13, verse 55. They're not particularly positive. Uh, he's just part of the brothers of Jesus who seem to think that Jesus has gone bonkers and they want him to come home. But we know very little about him. Uh, apart from an early tradition that he possibly ministered in Judea uh, in the 60s or during the, the years before the fall of Jerusalem. In terms of recipients and date, uh, we have very little indication. Um, uh, he does tell us in his, in his own words, those who have been called in chapter 1 verse 1, and that doesn't help us a little bit not even a little bit to identify the actual recipients of this letter, uh, to those who have been called who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. That could be you and I. Uh, so it could be anybody. And it's not possible for us to determine the background, the place of writing, the recipients, where they live, or anything more than that. Um, and although some critical scholars date Judas or Jude as late as the second century, there's no reason to believe that he wrote later than about 80 A.D., somewhere between 60 and 80 A.D., perhaps even while he was in Jerusalem or a leader among the leadership in Jerusalem in the 60s. When it comes to Peter and Jude, I've already referred to this somewhat, but there are some striking similarities between Jude and the second chapter of Second Peter, uh, the common thread being the fact that both warn against false prophets. And when you read through Jude and then you read through Second Peter chapter 2, you will see some of the similarities. Now, there are many, many possibilities, many explanations for, or possible explanations for that. They may have had a common source that they have used, uh, or they were facing a common enemy or a common problem. They wrote during the same time, maybe to the same kind of people. Or Peter used Jude and expanded, or Jude used Peter and shortened, because that's exactly what is happening in terms of the length uh, of these sections. It is not possible for us to determine any longer exactly why they have so much in common. But it is true that Jude refers to and quotes some of the Apocrypha, or some of the, uh, the letters that we have determined that do not belong to the canon of the Bible. The Epistle of Jude, and here's a quote from Wikipedia, references two other books, one which is non-canonical in all churches, in other words, no church tradition anywhere accepts that as canonical. The other non-canonical in most churches, there are a few traditions that accept um, that book as canonical. Verse 9, and it's uh, worth reading it, uh, let me back up into verse 8. It says, In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. 
yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. Now, when he talks about Moses and the body of Moses, then he is quoting an apocryphal book. Um, this is from the Assumption of Moses, which is in the Apocrypha, uh, and it provides an account of this particular dispute. Verses 14 to 15 contains a direct quote of a prophecy from the book of Enoch. And it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts that they have done in the ungodly way. And, and of all the harsh words, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I think the ungodly word here is uh, occurring a few times. Um, but it's a quote from the book of Enoch. I have said this to you before, but when there is lack of information, it creates the space for suggestion and all sorts of um, riddles and stories and uh, speculation, really. And that is how the book of Enoch came into existence, because there's one line in the Old Testament about Enoch. He walked with God and then he was no more. And then the speculation starts. So what happened to him? And then the stories start. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us, but now we make up the stories, and this is the kind of book that we have in uh, the book of Enoch. And uh, so the one thing we do need to understand is that Jude quotes these two apocryphal sources, Enoch chapter 1 verse 9, we find that in verses 14 and 5, 15, and then the Apocalypse of Moses, uh, or the Ascension of Moses, and you can see that in verse 9. Does this mean that Jude legitimized the use of the Apocrypha? Well, certain church, church traditions will say yes, but it's interesting to note that only one of these books is used by some traditions, limited church traditions. The other one is not recognized by any uh, of those uh, traditions. But Jude does not really give us the right. I mean, the, way, the, the reason or the, the fact that he uses those apocrypha does not give us the right to go and say these apo apocryph apocryphal books can or should be used. But it does say that Jude was familiar with the contents. And we must also remember that the, even the Old Testament canon was not exactly complete by the time of the New Testament. So many Jews use those books. And it is true to say that for several years of Christianity, a couple of hundred years of Christianity, that many early church fathers continued to use the Apocrypha until the church, through a process of let's call it elimination and determination, and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, came to the point of deciding on the canon that we now have. And therefore, we would stand in that tradition, and we can use Jude, because Jude is in the Bible, we can quote Jude, but it doesn't give us the right to go and quote the Apocrypha and use them as the Word of God. I hope I'm, trying, I'm making that clear. When we look at the, at the contents and outline of Jude, verses 1 to 2 is an introduction. Then we have a long section, verses 3 to 16, about the false prophets. Uh, verses 17 to 23, encouragement to be steadfast. And um, really, that, that's what he, he, he's talking about, the false prophets, and how false they are, and how wrong they are, how ungodly they are, to quote him, and the NIV translation of that. But then he comes to verse 20, and he says, Actually, in verse 17, he says, But, dear friends, remember what the apostles and our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the, last in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. And here's his advice. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And then in Jude we have uh, one of the most beautiful doxologies. Uh, and you may have heard this prayed in, in churches uh, probably in the past, but uh, doxology is a praise statement. And he says in verse 24, 
and 5. To Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Uh, Amen. The message and highlights in Jude, his primary focus is that of false teachers and how we need to oppose them uh, and identify them and, and, and actually not be misled by them. He also encourages his readers to stand firm. Um, and then I've already read that uh, uh, final doxology. Now, that brings us to the end of the New Testament uh, letters and Gospels and the book of Acts. Uh, the end of the 26th book. One single book remains, and that's the book of Revelation. And so next time when we get together, when we come together, uh, we'll look at the book of Revelation. Uh, the lecture will be slightly shorter so that we can um, have a time or give an opportunity for those who write the exam to come back after tea and to write their exam. I trust that you've enjoyed it and enjoyed your last uh, little stint uh, before we get into our teeth into the book of Revelation. May the Lord bless you.